going on, everybody? Hope you are having a wonderful week so far. Um, before we start, I would absolutely love it if you could give this podcast a review if you're listening on Apple or Spotify or whatever platform you listen to. Um, it does just keep the podcast going. Um, makes the people at these platforms go, oh, this is an interesting podcast and might feature it, which means more people will listen to it, which means we can get more amazing guests. Um, so, yeah, I thank you for that if you do do that. Uh, podcast time. This week, label owner, artist, amazing producer, DJ, also a podcaster, the one known as Scuba. Um, Scuba has been in the scene for a very long time and has achieved some amazing accolades over the years. His record label, Hot Flush Recordings, has been around for 20 years now and is celebrating 20 years birthday, uh, which is 20 years in this music industry is a huge achievement as but alone. They, as a label, have brought on some huge artists um and carry on to do so um it's been very polarizing as a record label over the years with some huge genre changes um which has been slightly frowned upon um by some but also applauded by many others and i really respect that scuba is also got a podcast called the not a diving podcast which is another great electronic music podcast um talking to people in the the scene which i'm always for more people getting involved in the podcasting game so after you've listened to that go check that out um and i'm going to stop rambling on without further ado scuba scuba what's cooking man yeah how you doing i'm good uh nice to be here thanks for having me on thanks for coming on lovely to meet you um in person i've been a huge fan over the years um followed what you've done and also a fellow podcaster which is always nice to have somebody else that that has a, a music based podcast um on the podcast it's always not many there's not many people out there doing it so it's really interesting to sit down with you and uh have you on how's yeah i i was uh well after i started mine i, I wasn't aware of yours because i think you've been you've been going for a, i don't know i think you're well. probably a year ahead of me or something mm. uh, but i wasn't aware of yours and then when i discovered yours i was like fuck <laughs> Damn. i thought i was the only one doing it every week but uh yeah i wasn't i'm not at all so yeah um let's uh well <laughs> there's no beef obviously so <laughs> no i like... think this is the thing is like the the the, in, the the interesting thing about this music industry right and i don't and tell me if you think it's completely wrong but a lot of people when they're insecure about what they're doing doesn't like it when other people do something that they're also doing and thinks that they're like they're the first people that should have done it so nobody else can do it whereas in this situation, like when there's multiple people doing podcasts, for me, it's like, it's great because it means that more people are going to be listening to podcasts for in this industry. And there isn't many. There's, you have one, Tiga has one that he does occasionally. There's like a dude called Willie Joy in America that's been doing one for like four or five years. There's like a few other like more like band oriented ones, but there's nothing really in the electronic music. Team. RA do one, obviously, but RA is a little bit different. Um, but it's it's just it's nice to get multiple people doing it in the industry. I think it actually brings it to a wider audience. Yeah, um, I think people have that kind of thing where are oh, like that person that producers like biting my style or yeah. whatever yeah you know which is <laughs> which is, as you say probably a more a sign of insecurity than anything else mm. and um but with yeah like you say with podcasting it's kind of like an ecosystem isn't it really if you look at how for example like comedy podcasts work yeah. like it's very much of a kind of self-reinforcing thing so people make appearances on each other's and like it it just it's sort of uh it's it becomes greater than some of it of some of its parts right so um i think it's really healthy and there should be more of them and you know but everyone has their own sort of distinctive way of doing it i think that's what's totally. so good about it particularly with um you know when it's musicians talking to musicians because you know like you say 
RA having one is all well and good, but you know, that's a media institution, yeah. right? And yeah, I've, I've said plenty about music journalists in the past. <laughs> and for me, it's just nice to have a an area where musicians can talk to each other without that kind of supervision mm. of journalists, you know, without that kind of like sword hanging over your head, you know, which is is there when you're speaking on the record to someone in that kind of a context so yeah having uh having a sort of ecosystem develop where there's lots of these conversations going on i think it's really healthy yeah it's great and and like i said everyone does do it in a different way so it's not a it's definitely not a zero-sum game you know it's not a case of like competition and you know and obviously you know to, to return to the original point the um <laughs> it can sometimes seem like that with with music generally you know you can, it sometimes seems like you're in competition with the people and like you know someone has a big tune everyone you know everyone rips off that style a little yeah. bit and that becomes the kind of um you know the, the the fashionable way of doing it for a bit and then it moves on and you know that's just how it works totally. you know and it's no point in getting precious about it i mean if someone's copying your music that means you're doing something good right that's that's a compliment yeah so you know, I, 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 uh, yeah, I have very little patience for that kind of attitude. But, but like I said, yeah, with podcasting, it's like, yeah, it's it's unequivocally positive to have more of them. Yeah, I totally agree. What made you start yours? Well, basically, because there weren't very many of them. Mm. Essentially, uh, I, I thought there were none. Uh, but um, you know, regardless, there were certainly very few. Yeah, and I'm just a fan of the of the format. You know, I just like listening to long conversations yeah. you know with people who are sort of like-minded but are you know not like um carrying the baggage of like i said when you when you're formally interviewed by a journalist like that that's a very specific dynamic you know between those two people and i just think that when you know people who are don't well where, where it's when it's a genuinely level playing field i guess is how i'd put it it just it just uh yields something a bit more interesting yeah. i think and there just isn't that much of it uh and i felt let's give it a crack mm. you know i mean i just i'm an avid consumer of, of podcasts generally and i just really like um the whole the whole thing you know and just and to, to, to have that to be brought to electronic music kind of more the more underground side of electronic music i just think it's it's a you know it's a positive, you know, and I wanted to contribute to it. And, you know, it's been fun doing it. I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot of work doing it every week, but you know, it is, it is uh, rewarding. Yeah. It is definitely a lot of work. Do you do like a bunch at a time or do you just do on a weekly basis? Like when you, when you record? I mean, it varies. I'm actually doing three this week, which yeah. is, which is a lot. Um, and I'm, I'm actually doing one, which is, uh, with, um, with someone who's written a book and we're talking about her book so i've got to read the book like <laughs> tomorrow i've started it but i haven't been, i definitely haven't finished it so uh normally i mean i don't know how much research you do for yours but normally i'll spend like i don't know a couple of hours max yeah you know read, reading old interviews and that sort of thing mm. uh, and occasionally but when it's someone you know well it's a little bit different but you know fairly often it's someone who i know of and maybe have spoken to you know a couple of times or whatever yeah. but certainly know them inside out so I find like, yeah, just just doing a little bit of uh, reading around, you know, what they've said in the past and what the kind of interesting things might be that they've said and what, you know, what the uh, interesting topics might be to dig into. So, yeah, I'll, I'll do that, Max. But like, yeah, I tend to do uh, I tend to do one a week in answer to your original question. Yeah. This week is a an exception. Um, and I don't know. I mean, I find I mean, I have had weeks like this week before, but actually what I find is that if there's a kind of regular sort of if i do do them regularly one a week i'll just kind of get into the swing of it i find mm. if i have a break from it like getting back into it it's like not djing for yeah. a while you know the first the first setbacks a bit like well the first hour anyway it's a bit like oh okay yeah um so i think i mean that's my preference for doing it but um you know scheduling uh dictates it to a certain extent it's a nightmare um, can be <laughs> it can be no absolutely right how about you how, how do you find it generally um like, i I, it's, no. I've been doing it for three three years now. Um, I think you'll be like the 163rd episode. So it's like taken me a long time to kind of get into the swing of things. When I first started out, it was like literally just like winging it every week and just being like, damn, I can't get, I need somebody on the podcast. So I just call a mate up who I just could 
get last minute to, to get on and to, and talk to them. Um, but now it's like way more planned out. And I tried, <clears throat> I do like recording days. So like today I do, I, yesterday I did two, today I do two. And then it kind of gives me my month of, for the for May complete. So, and then I will then send it to my editor and then uh, edit it out. So it's like, I'm, I'm just doing the, the conversating now, um, which is so much nicer um rather than having to do all the editing is on top of that it's been we only just took an editor on and it's it's an absolute game changer for me um but i think for me i don't really do much research at all like i i just kind of go in not actually wanting to know much about them and trying to find more about them on the podcast um i think that's where our our shows differ yours yours is um like you it feels like and I, and I don't know if you're if I'm wrong or not but it feels like you come in with a bit more of an agenda a, bit, a bit more of, of questions which I'm just winging it 24 <laughs> 7 um and that's, Wait, no, do I, go on sorry no go on carry on well I was just going to say that I, what I tend to do is I'll have like a limited number of questions that I write down yeah start with like maybe four or five max mm. like I'll have I usually have like a first question and then I'll have like if there's a certain amount of topics that I want to cover, I'll maybe have one question for each topic, but then I don't necessarily answer them all. But I I I do, I do sort of like have a vague structure of the yeah. conversation in advance. Um, I just I've just found that's the easiest way of doing it. But I mean, you know, there, there certainly have been ones there where I've gone in with no notes at all, and I mean sometimes those are the best ones actually. Like there isn't I don't think it's a right or wrong way of doing it really. I mean there are, there are. You know, if there are certain topics you want to discuss, I think well, I certainly find that it's it's useful to you know think about them in advance, and then when you think about them, then you you oh, do yeah. have questions that naturally come into your head. So I mean, not writing those down can be useful, but yeah, I mean, you know, it swings around about, isn't it? Really, I mean, particularly if 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 you know the person quite well, then it's it's obviously going to flow a, a little bit more uh, yeah. naturally. Um, but actually, I mean, having said that, sometimes. I mean, I've done I've done episodes with people who I've known who I know really well, like good friends, mm. and and I've in the content in the in the course of having that kind of like a two hour conversation, I find out things about people. Yeah, yeah, totally. That's I mean, that's the beauty of doing it. Really, it's like you know, you, when when do you sit down for someone for two hours and yep. just uh, just chat? You know, and have to be chatting all the time, right? Mm-hmm. You know, because if it's if you sit next to someone on a plane or whatever, maybe you'll chat for like half an hour of that two hour plane journey, but actually having to keep constant chat yeah. going especially with the host like the, pro- yeah, the, the pressure's on to like you know, keep the energy up you know what I mean? yeah no i totally agree this is the reason why i started the podcast for me and it was like there's as artists we tour around we see each other we we have like some friends in the industry obviously um but when do we get the chance to actually sit down and like have a long form conversation with no distractions, like no phones are on, nothing like it's literally just you and I. And and I think it's, it can create really interesting conversations. But also on top of that, it allows the listener to be in that. But when we're doing the conversation, we don't think about the listener. It's literally just you and that other person, which is really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the that's the nature of the of the format, really, isn't it? Mm. I mean, I think like you know the the ones that I enjoy the most, I think like other podcasts that I enjoy the most are those kind of um, like free form sort of discussions that seem to go everywhere and anywhere, you know. Yeah. Um, and kind of developing that as a well, I mean, it, it is kind of a it is a skill. Uh, that you develop I think as a as a host because it's not um and that kind of thing doesn't always happen mm. just you know, as a matter of course um I think like there is this kind of knowing like where to prod someone and like you know where to kind of jump in and yeah. like you know sort of like which paths to go down you know which it's kind of on you as the host to kind of um make those calls in uh certain instances and that can really add a lot to it but um you know i i also think that like you know where, where, when it is a genuine conversation rather than an interview that's when you get the best episodes yeah you know, I where, agree. when it's back and forth instead of just and and i think like you know 
you know, going back to the RA one, um, RA have had people on. There's one, there's one in particular who I won't mention by name who I was trying to persuade to come on mine, and they went on RA instead. And it's the kind of he's the kind of guy who will only do one kind of thing, yeah. like every I don't know, like five years. And I was just listening to it. I was like, man, this is shit. You should have done mine. Like, <laughs> <you know? laughs> yeah, the RA one. Well, this is the thing. Is like it is very press oriented. It's very interview style. It's like this 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 is very formulaic which is great it's a great podcast but it's also not you're not getting the character of the actual artist through that's what how it feels to me mm-hmm. yeah are you um, anti-press let me i'm just gonna have to open my door because i'm do you think my bad connection here hang on a sec do you think Right, hopefully God. should improve <laughs> gotta let that yeah. wi-fi through yeah i mean seriously it's but i'm gonna get a cat in here though this is gonna be the uh, uh <laughs> unfortunate fine. downside it's of this good. But, uh, have you seen have you used those amazon routers they're like uh no so the i got them in my place and it like it's like it's like a booster like a typical booster but they're on another level where like you could put one in the room where you're at and it literally will make it as fast as what your internet is normally. Right. I mean, I've got a booster and it's shit. I've been trying to connect to it and it's just not happening. I'll send, I'll, I'll send you a it? link to one. It's like, it, it's it's called like mesh, mesh Wi-Fi. It's fucking unbelievable. Where I live in the UK, it's like the middle of nowhere. The internet was like, for years, we'd get like two meg download. It was awful. Um, right. And... Uh, when we got fiber, it was like the because the walls in the house are just like super. It's like a farmhouse, so it's like super thick. You would never get Wi-Fi. And then mm. I got these Amazon Mesh Wi-Fi things, and it was an absolute game changer. You get like two hundred meg from all around the house. It's wild. Nice. Okay. Yeah, you need to get. Yeah, that's like what I need. So, um, talking about press, are you anti-press? Are you are you are you not into it? <laughs> um, I'm not anti. No, I'm not anti-press. I'm anti... Uh, I, don't if, I don't know if anti is the right word. I am frustrated with the standards of journalism mm. in music today. Uh, and I'm not sure whether that's the same as being anti-press. I mean, in fact, no, I'm, I'm not anti-press. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I think that when done well music journalism is great yeah. you know it, it really adds a lot to the ecosystem of me mu- and particularly underground music where music discovery is such an important thing and like i think having a, a genuinely sort of critical eye um whereby uh you know like I think a lot of musicians complain about bad reviews, mm. you know, just as a general thing. And recently I've seen people just complaining about a bad review just on the basis of it being a bad review. Yeah. And I'm definitely not one of those people. I, I absolutely think that there should be space for good writers thinking about music intelligently and articulating that in print or whatever, you know, communication is appropriate. Um, probably video these days to be honest but like whatever like the you know the, the critical aspect being the important bit right yeah and i just don't think it exists anymore and where mm. it does exist it's just this one-eyed uh sort of monocultural really quite snobbish yeah but not in a good way <laughs> i mean i do think like snobbery is you know there is something to be said for snobbery if you depending on how you define it but um like I just think like it it's just a very small group of people. I mean when I say small, I mean yeah, in terms of who their what their backgrounds are. And this is true for journalism as a whole, actually, but I think it's particularly true in music journalism. Um and you know, <clears throat> I just don't think it adds anything yeah. as it is. Uh, and that frustrates me because it didn't it doesn't have to be that way. It wasn't always that way. I mean, I think like the dance press generally has has <laughs> I mean, a feature of a dance press has always been that it's a little bit dumb. Yeah. But that's kind of okay as long as that's it, you know, as long as that it accepts itself for what it is. Like I remember reading um, 
you know reviews of of twelves in like hardcore fanzines, right? And it'd be like you know written as if you're like on the way back from a rave, like <laughs> reviewing a tune you've heard whilst off your face. It's like yeah, fucking amazing, nine out of ten. And then one of them will get ten out of ten. It's like tune of the week, ten out of ten. <laughs> but like, I mean, that's that's fine. It, like it is, you know, it is what it is. Yeah, you know, to use an annoying term, but like you know, like it's unpretentious, I guess that mm. kind of thing. And and typically. You know, thinking about like music mags in the in the nineties, I'm I'm, I'm loath to kind of hark back to the nineties, but like you know, music mag, um mix mag for example in the nineties was almost like that, and then it became a sort of lifestyle thing, and 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 it gradually moved morphed into what it is now. But like, I think an RA um had a you know a brief period in its early days as being like quite cool and open minded. And um, you know, a, a genuinely uh, a site that was worth reading, mm. basically. And then you know, as a result, with various editorial turns, it's just become this kind of parody. And you know, it's yeah, whatever. It's, and it's, it's right now. <laughs> it's just a joke, you know. It's it, like I said, it's a parody of itself. Um, as a result of editorial decisions going back probably ten years at this point. But I just think that you know, um. As I mentioned, journalism as a whole is in a bit of a state, and the sort the forces that have led journalism uh, as a profession to that point are, you know, are there and present in music journalism in, in a very similar way. Um, and it's just it's difficult to see how it changes. Mm. Frankly, that's what um, I was going to say. Is like, what? How do you see that changing? And how how can it be fixed? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, tr- sort of traditional, the traditional music mag is is done uh, in the mm. same way as the traditional sort of magazine is is done. Um, I think that I really think there is space for proper reviews yeah. of music, intelligent reviews of music. I think the format of those reviews is something which is uh, needs to be developed into something which is which is make which makes sense for music fans because at the end of the day the people who are really into music are young yeah. generally like you know the people who want to hear new music reviewed or want to see new music reviewed are you know i don't know 16 to 24 maybe and you know they're not going to read a blog really it needs to be in a format which is going to make sense to them um so it, just, it needs real uh you know a, a bit of creative direction you know and um probably some money to go with it but i think like you know the you know stuff like the podcast ecosystem i think provides the opportunity for that kind of thing to develop yeah which doesn't necessarily need a lot of resources i mean that's just the beauty of technology right i mean like the barriers to entry to stuff really come down quite significantly so i don't know man it's um it's tough. And I, on, on the one hand, I feel like, how can I contribute to this? But on the other, I'm like, well, it's not really my job. You yeah. Know, I, I guess the question for me to you, though, is like, obviously, you're an artist and a record label owner and a podcaster. And it's like, do we need it anymore? Do we need reviews? Do we need that press or the, the classic press that we all think? or that we all know of from growing up with when we would go buy a magazine and, or we'd go and what read a blog or something like that. Do, is, is that actually necessary nowadays? I don't know if it's necessary, but I think it's, it's desirable personally. Mm. I think like having tastemakers, you know, lots of different ones, not just like one who's a kind of arbiter of what's cool or whatever. But I think like, you know, having um, essentially what, uh, the, the music press since the I guess the seventies is when it developed into the kind of uh, into what we look back as look back at now as being the kind of golden age of it. Like there were it wasn't just public publications; it was individual journalists yeah. who had really distinctive voices and you know provided music fans with a kind of context for music. And you know th- you could reliably say you follow a journalist and know that. Yeah, you know, if they liked something, then you probably would like it too. I think mm-hmm. there's absolutely room for that. Um, 
I mean, I've, you know, I, <laughs> I'm looking at like comparing it to something like movie reviews. Yeah, yeah. Right. I really think something like that could work for music. Like, I mean, I was thinking about, you know, there's, there's very various movie podcasts, but I mean, people in the UK will know the Kermode and Mayo podcast. I think there's there's such a opportunity for something like that where you have a host who's a kind of just a random music fan and yeah. they're a kind of specialist critic and they and it works in that in a similar kind of a way like the host doesn't really have a, a, an interest in everything um and then you have this you know, opinionated um person yeah giving a kind of expert quote-unquote expert view i guess that's how it works it's kind of the the host is kind of the layman and the the, uh, the critic is offering like a real kind of level of technical knowledge and insight. And I think something like that could hundred percent work. Yeah, I music, agree. You know, but I think the issue is is that we're still so caught on printing, on print and internet. Like it's not like that would one hundred percent work as a podcast, or even as like an Instagram clip or a TikTok clip or a YouTube long form or something like that. But it, it, we're just not getting that. Sorry, you broke up there. I didn't get to the end of that. I, I, I meant I said that like it feels like it's more so a platform thing. Is like we're so used to to blogs, websites, magazines, and it feels like the whole press of the music industry hasn't, in that sense, hasn't kind of moved over to that YouTube podcast, Discord, um, social media yeah, kind I mean, of platforms. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I like you know. All right, look at the RA podcast. Yeah. You know, it's just completely unimaginative. And the approach is that these legacy media institutions, which is, you know, what the likes of Mix Mag and DJ Mag and all the rest of it, um, you know, they haven't adapted, yeah. I would argue. I agree. And, you know, their attempts at adaption, like doing podcasts, are just inadequate. You know, and I really think there's, there's room to be creative with that sort of thing. And there's room to be, um, you know, to add real value. Mm. Um, I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be from one of those pre-existing brands or pre-existing platforms. I mean, you know, I think that there is a real uh, gap in the market, I would say, for kind of good, intelligent criticism of music, which is, you know, which adds something to people trying to, kind of discover new stuff because the problem is now i mean the, the backdrop to all this is just the sheer volume of music which gets released is just you know it's daunting yeah frankly it's mind-blowing how much shit there is out there and most of it is shit but like quite a lot of it is not you know quite a lot of it is good so you know having a a number of trusted sources an ecosystem of trusted sources who are gonna you know give you like a genuine um crit like a genuine critique coming from a position of expertise i think it would be it'd be great it'd yeah, be, i wish I that stuff existed man <laughs> i would listen to that shit yeah i think so. i think that's the thing is a good conversation about music like is really important i guess the only real platforms we kind of we can look up to right now which is obviously radio um in the uk um but also specialist radio is is not got the power as what it used to like an essential new tune back in the day was the biggest thing that happened to you as an artist and could change your life from one record to another um whereas it doesn't feel like it has the power as much and now spotify and apple with their playlist in it's kind of like it doesn't feel like well, this is a lot apple is a slightly different spotify just feels it's slightly not taste as tasteful as it could be um <laughs> that's what we're putting it i mean i mean it has been argued on my podcast by me and but also other people independently of me voicing the opinion that streaming basically is radio mm -hmm. like that's the function that it fills yep. now and you know the fragmentation of people's uh, attention has meant that you know has led to the decline as you describe of you know those legacy 
like Radio One essentially in the UK. Yeah, and there isn't really a equivalent no. in in the US. But I mean, that's the, that's the most. Um, it's historically the most important radio station in dance music, I think, globally. Mm-hmm. But you know, the um, just the like plethora of other options has just by definition meant that's gone down. But but you know, to return to the original point, um, streaming fills that function for people, and and specifically playlists within streaming platforms do that job and a lot of the music discovery function of radio and and press arguably um has been sort of farmed out to those editorial lists and also increasingly uh algorithmic yeah playlists too but i mean like the um the power of the editor i think is not really fully acknowledged but actually i mean and having said that like my understanding is that plat- streaming platforms are moving away from editorial and, and further towards alg- algorithmic playlists um so i don't know what that's gonna eventually look like but re- but regardless like i think like the like i said the function of of streaming is essentially radio yeah but i mean that's just i think that's just where we are and i think you know we're not going back i don't think I think the thing the thing that I mostly have an issue with is the fact that the editors not and this is it may sound disrespectful to the editors but it's like when you used to get the mixed bag reviews right you would get uh you'd get somebody that reviews dubstep drum and bass techno like somebody separate for each one mm-hmm. whereas a lot of these a lot of these editors are all just doing all dance music, all electronic music. And right. and that then just purely comes down to personal taste or the relationships of the editor and the artist, which doesn't bring new artists through. It doesn't bring interest in music through. It's purely down to one taste. Um, and I think that just completely fucks the whole industry because it's not about pushing interest in music forward it's about what's popping off right now on the algorithms and what do i like as a as a person or who's my mate sure i mean one thing we've talked about on my show a fair bit recently has been record shops and Mm -hmm. decline of record shops and the function they've historically filled in the in the scene in terms of people discovering new music and the roles of people that work in record shops in that discovery right so you know previously and this is definitely not true now but um you know previously having someone on side having a member of staff in a key record shop who was a really who was really on side with your label or with you generally that could be so useful so helpful yeah. you know is you know, people you know, particularly the bigger shops the more influential shops you know these huge tastemaker DJs would come in, you know, and you've got the, the the key dude is, you know, recommending your stuff, and like like that was a a big part of it, which is gone now, basically mm-hmm. entirely gone. Because I mean, to the extent that the vinyl market still exists, it's largely uh, driven by online sales, and you know, there's stuff like Boomcat which still exists, and they do have their <laughs> they have their review thing, which um you know people have their own views on, but you know the uh the sort of um the tradition of going into a shop and getting given uh, a, a stack of records by a um probably quite snooty opinionated <laughs> member of staff they were the worst man they were the worst well, I'm I mean, sorry <laughs> absolutely agree with you but they still filled an important function yeah right like they were they were important people for better or for worse sometimes for worse but yeah, you know, that, that stuff is gone. And, you know, I think, you know, I think the a wider question is, you know, dance music is a very nostalgic scene, generally, like we look back, you know, and we largely in the music and uh, suddenly over the last 10 years, try to recreate the music of the past and try to recreate vibes of the past yeah. but actually music has moved on largely and the scene has moved on in many respects and i think there's a there's a general struggling 
to come to terms with that you know there's so much denial with people like you know like the uh, the kind of hysteria over you know streaming payback rates and you know the when Bandcamp got bought out by epic the kind of hand wringing yeah that <laughs> accompanied that and people are just terrified of change yeah. basically on the one hand um and largely the music and the, the raves reflect that, but, but it changes here. It's coming, you know, and it's, it's only going to get worse. You know, I think I, I, an example of this, actually, I've, like DJ Pierre was, um, he posted on Instagram yesterday, something about AI and was just like, fucking hell, this is bad. And it does look bad. Don't get me wrong. Like the, the implications, potential implications for music, um, for, for making music anyway, that come from AI pretty scary yeah. but like it was just it was such a stereotypical dance music reaction just like fuck this is gonna <laughs> destroy everything you know yeah it's really interesting because it's like I got a few friends in tech um that look at the AI and they their their view on AI is completely different to the the music artist and the music creator where they're like we can use AI to just completely change our lives and completely just like help us get to where we want to get to in a more efficient way and every artist that i have spoke to is like fuck ai it's screwing us over blah 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 i've actually got a friend who he he makes most of his uh, money through piano music um and like mm. boshes out a bunch of piano piano things and gets playlists on spotify and makes reasonably good good cash from it and he's like dude this AI is literally just taking everything away from us. <laughs> but Yeah, I mean, I can see that. Yeah. I absolutely can see that. But I guess that for me, that also then, like, on the business side of things, I'm like, okay, how do you come around from that? How do you, how do you like, really create? Because I, personally, I don't think Spotify is going to be around forever. There's going to be something new that kind of brings something, bring a different option if that makes sense and and i think what is this just bringing it closer to the to the kind of forefront of like what is going to be next we we're very we're very we all know spotify is a tech company not a music company we all know it's about making it a, what tech companies are for that to make money and steal all of our data so like what is it for the music people like is there a way to create something that is for the music people so my hypothesis on this is that uh, essentially live performance will accrete, if that's the right word, will accumulate more and more share of the value mm. of the business, basically. So uh, the performance on stage, in person, um, which gets you the kind of direct link with the uh, fan, let's use that word, um, that's just going to become more and more valuable and the relative value of recorded music will just decline and decline uh, kind of almost like in in sync with that, yeah. inversely proportional to that. Um, <clears throat> and I think that uh, particularly dance music i mean like you know that that example of a piano music absolutely um chimes i mean stuff which is basically just uh, stuff which is highly functional actually the way it's in terms of the way it's used yeah. you know the words the way people use that um and but dance music is absolutely <laughs> in the firing line there right i mean <laughs> it's your average house tune got a hundred percent be made by an algorithm yeah. now no doubt 100 percent. um but you couldn't do the same thing with the dj set right and you know people want stars that's that's the bottom line that's what resonates with people i mean totally. they wouldn't necessarily think about it in quite those terms but you know who is you know the, the most successful new djs uh of the past few years i don't think it's a coincidence in a period where the music's basically gone nowhere creatively like the the most successful new DJs look fantastic. Yeah. That's that's what they're bringing to the table. Like they look great, you know, and that's what people are resonating with mm. now, right? Uh, it's a kind of aspirational thing. And don't get me wrong, that's always been part of music, right? Image has always been a huge part of music, of course. So it's nothing necessarily new there. But 
I think it's increasingly the most important thing. And it will, uh, I mean, they're, they're, they're always trends, but I think that kind of direct personal connection with that is associated with performance and experience of that performance that's the stuff which is going to be worth money if you're talking about the business and like where's the money in the business it's going to be that i think increasingly that i mean it always that that has that's been a trend which has already already been kind of rolling out over the last 20 years uh but i think it's going to accelerate and i think the ability of um music which is quite quite good enough which is i mean that's the term i've used a fair bit like I think like most of the, uh, the the advances in music tech over the last 20 years have basically haven't yielded like new sounds. They've just made it easier to make existing sounds. And that's that's made that's what's behind essentially this avalanche of music, which is good enough to play in a club. Um, so AI is just going to accelerate that yeah. again. And what is I would say likely is that you know we're not going to have, you know, uh, big leaps forward in music style and music kind of genres and inventiveness but what you'll have is like yeah huge shows amazing production like people having an amazing time listening to this stuff and that's fine but that's what it will be and that's where the money will be that's that's my uh that's my large scale prediction no i um, I, I don't disagree i guess the one thing that's be interesting for you as a label owner as well as an artist but when you go from the vinyl days to the streaming days. Um, well, you go from the vinyl days to the ripping of music days when no money was made to then the streaming days where there was money kind of coming back in. And what I've found as having my own label, but also as an artist and releasing music is that there, if your music is streaming, there's a constant revenue, whether it's an, enough money to pay your bills but there's a c continuous revenue of of finance coming in whereas in the vinyl days you press 300 vinyl and it was that was it there was no more revenue coming in on that set on sales on on music how do you find that as like a label owner has it changed your finances your revenue is it changed how you guys release music or or not yeah, well, I mean, like like you say, there's been basically three periods in the time that we've been putting out stuff, which is 20 years, yeah. unfortunately. Um, <laughs> um, so, like, like the middle period, as you said, uh, which was the kind of quote unquote the iTunes period, was was just a disaster mm. for everyone. I mean, I think with um, looking at the the, the period before that where physical product was um yeah. primary like it was a uh, it was much more labor and capital intensive as a process but it wouldn't necessarily mean that your revenue streams were limited it just depended on whether there was demands for your stuff to be in print basically yeah. so i mean the, the most profitable releases that we've had or the, the, let me if I can use an example, I won't say what it is, but like the most the most profitable release we've ever had was something which sold a ton of CDs. Mm. And CD was just the most <laughs> beautiful yeah. format for people selling music. For the, for the music fan, it was a fucking ripoff <laughs> and just the worst thing ever. But if you're selling music, oh, it was just amazing. And, you know, we sold tens of thousands of this CD, which is just, just an avalanche of money. Mm. Like, incredible. Um, but there was just demand for it. So we just keep, keep pressing more. Right. Yeah. So, and, and same with vinyl, like, um, even, even today there is, um, well, a large part of the vinyl market is driven by, um, demand for classics basically. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, this is sort of true, uh, for streaming as well, but particularly in, um, in vinyl, like if you've got like, um, if you've got some of those classics, the rights to them, you can just repress them endlessly. And, you know, there, there is a demand for that stuff. Absolutely. Um, so it's just about demand. But, I mean, with streaming, you're, you're right to say that uh, it, it ticks away, basically. And if you've got um, and, and, and the, the key difference, of course, is that you don't need any money to yeah. press 
whatever format needs to be pressed. So it's literally just a case of sitting around and waiting for it to come in. Um, so that's good and preferable, certainly to the iTunes model, which was just, yeah, as I said, a, a disaster. I mean, I think like the um, the area which things could be improved significantly is in the execution of contracts and the collection of, of royalties. I mean, that that could be massively improved and the potential for blockchain stuff to, to do that, I think, is is really interesting. And obviously, everyone's down on crypto stuff now because the, because the price went down and everyone lost all their money. Uh, but but in in reality, like the the technology behind that stuff is still super interesting. I mean, look, the example I always use is ticketing, but I think um, with royalty collection as well. If that entire system was was fully automated, yeah, from the signing of the contract through to the the collection of the royalties that would just be an enormous game changer for mm. artists and you know and m i think mostly for really niche artists making underground music i think that would be it's just it would completely flip the script because you know it would just enable the kind of micro payments which um largely elusive you know but if, if you've got um particularly if you're not releasing your own music like the ability of of underground labels to administrate a big catalog is a huge challenge and and you know like if you're generating even if it's like you know say say you've got um say you've got a bit say if you're an artist and you've got a, a number of releases like like 10 years of releases like maybe however many but they're split over different record labels like each one is generating you know 100 quid a quarter or whatever like or, or less or like 20 or 30 quid a quarter like the totality of your catalog is generating a, a nice bit of cash every month yeah but you're probably not seeing it because it's just like you know just dissipated out into the ether and it's subject to the whims and you know staffing uh um inadequacies of underground record labels right <laughs> but if that whole thing was automated which it 100 could be yeah that would be a game changer and i think that there is real potential for that to happen i think the I issue the issue with i totally agree i think it would be amazing i think like obviously you being an artist and also you being a record label owner, you know the intricacies be behind all of that. And the issue is, is you're dealing with, you're dealing with Spotify, Apple Music, all the streaming platforms, all the digital download platforms, et cetera, et cetera. And then that then gets fished down to distribution. Then distribution gets fished down to the record label. And then the record label either fishes that out to an accounting software or company to kind of then put it out to the artist so you, you've got like a five track kind of ladder where it just doesn't work <laughs> five, five potential points of failure any of which like fuck up your entire revenue right and we all know it fails at number one it fails at the top so we're all fucked by the by the time it gets down to it and the thing that really i really struggle with if i'm honest where it just makes zero sense to me is like in every form of business you get paid 30 days after after invoice no matter what you as an artist you only get paid twice a year from your royalties mm -hmm. and some record labels will be like we're only paying you if it's if it's more than a hundred dollars yeah so sometimes you might not even get paid for your records yeah and yes a hundred dollars isn't the most amount of money in the world however a hundred dollars 10 times accounts to a lot of a lot of money yeah like like, like i said you you might have you know 20 years of, of how many you might have a hundred releases on 20 different record labels or or more you know and without a centralized, a, a really rigorous centralized uh, method of, of collecting that money, we have a situation that we have now is that you know, most people don't get anywhere near what they should be getting. Mm. You know? but, yeah. How do you fix that, though? Because I, I think the, the whole blockchain thing, I love the idea of, but that means that you have to then get everybody on a blockchain. Oh, absolutely, yeah. It, require, it would require, like, 
total root and branch reform, like the abolition mm. of all the legacy royalty collection companies around the world, which is oh, so overdue, yeah. by the way. Like, they're just a fucking joke. Like, these, uh, you know, the likes of Gamo in, in, uh, in Germany. And, oh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> they're just terrible. They don't do what they're supposed to do, which is support artists. No, none make of them sure do. Artists get paid. It's like, it's just, they're basically um vested interests in an industry now you know which needs to go but i i I think like i mean it would require a pretty spectacular piece of political um achievement and the problem is that music is a relatively small piece of the entertainment pie and decreasingly important uh culturally so i mean the chances of this happening in any meaningful way or low but I, th- I do think that if um uh like if it was taken up in like if one country did it then there might be a a groundswell you mm. know if like if, if the uk did it um then it it's it's possible that it that it might spread but i mean it's a it, it's a big ask i realize but but the thing is like it's it's completely possible like it's not like the the the, um that 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 particular piece of technology is it, it couldn't be better designed for that particular purpose and that that was always the the issue before it was like you know we need a centralized uh, automatically executing system with which doesn't require any direct oversight but how can that be possible well it is possible like, yeah it's is there you know and I've, I've talked to people about people about this and their eyes just kind of glow. <laughs> they hear the word crypto or blockchain their eyes just kind of glow. <laughs> I guess the I guess the, the 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 only flaw in it for me that I see is that this really only counts for like the smaller artists because the bigger artists that like let's say for instance you're like Drake's you're Justin Bieber's and things like that they're doing insane deals with technically collection companies that pay them huge advances and then the collection company goes to Spotify, goes to Apple and goes, if you want this artist's music, you have to pay this rate on on the stream. And that's the I think that's the issue, is that the, realistically there's there's other companies making a shit ton of money out of the bigger artists and the bigger artists are getting such big advances that they don't have they don't need to stand up against the industry and they're the real ones that can actually say something about it. And do some, sure. Make I, mean, a I mean, the the other thing is that it's complete. It's in the interest of collection uh, societies and record labels, major label, major label record label, uh, major labels, major record labels. It's in their interests for the for the system to be opaque. Yeah, totally. Like, like the lack of transparency, transparency. I've, I've gotten out of talk. <laughs> the, the lack of transparency is a feature, not a bug. I mm-hmm. think of the system. Yeah, and you know like you're right to say that um fixing it will disproportionately help smaller artists and for that reason it's that much more of a challenge for it to for, to make it happen basically it's something that would, that would have to happen at government level yeah. i think and um i mean there are lobbying uh groups there are in, like you know industry institutions that represent smaller artists but i mean yeah going up against the majors is is a it's a big ask you know because the money just isn't there to do it but you know i think you can be fatalistic about this kind of stuff um the reality is if the political will was there then it could happen mm. you know um but at the moment it's obviously not it's not a priority you need some kind of um influential uh member of parliament to drive that kind of legislation through but it's yeah, not at the I'm forefront not, my not at the forefront 20 years of hot flush. How does that feel? <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's a bit weird <laughs> in all honesty. Um, it's yeah. I mean, my entire adult life really been yeah. doing it. And I was you know, looking through the catalog it was it struck me that yeah this is my life's work and it's a fucking strange like sensation to just realize that in something which you hadn't really been thinking about in those terms at all yeah um but i mean it's it's 
nice to be in this position, which is to say it's nice to have done something for 20 years, which is worth celebrating. Yeah. You know, I certainly don't think that 20 years ago I would would have expected it to be where it is now. You know, mm. I don't know. I mean, yeah, I mean, I have like it's been like the label has been such a um i guess it's been it's divided opinion so much over the years and to for it to have been essentially all me it's kind of difficult to have um avoided the sense you know the, the kind of sense that i've divided opinion even if it's not necessarily the case um it's quite to that extent i don't know i mean it's... what do you mean divided opinions well i mean well, i've pissed so many people off <laughs> in my a and r decisions you know yeah. so so many angry dubsteppers so many angry uh techno people when i've released house music so many you know just like why are you doing this you know is yeah. is a question that i've been asked so many times and i don't know i i just um i think it's basically the function of having no real managerial oversight over the music direction like no like board of directors like the position like you know the guy the catalog is is enough to keep it sort of ticking over as a going concern so there's no real pressure financially to do anything other than break even on a release and yeah, you know that just yields um a fairly haphazard scattergun approach yeah. if you have a music taste like mine you know like that's the problem i'm really quite wide ranging in in um in my interests mm. musically and i don't really have any filter when it comes to you know putting stuff out on the label you know if, if something takes my fancy then i'll put it out and like i said that's not been great from certain people's perspectives <laughs> over the years i guess from your from taking other people's opinions out of it though because it's very, for me, especially a label like Hot Flush is very personal to you as the artist. It's it's mm -hmm. very much, my artist's name is Scuba and I am champion, championing this sound right now. And I think for me, like, that's, that's how I've always looked at the label is like your dubstep days, your techno days, your house days and everything in between. Um, and I think that's the thing that I've, really respect about the label and this isn't me blowing smoke up your ass but it's like i think there's a lot of labels out there that just stick to one sound and yes maybe on a business side of things it works i was gonna say that's a smart move right <laughs> maybe, that maybe is it is smart move. but yeah, like 100 is yeah i say like for instance like i would say this to him so I, this isn't me talking shit but like dirty bird for example Dirty Bird in when they first kind of launched and the mid 2000s for me was like one of the strongest record labels out there that was just pushing music that was so just like nobody had ever heard of but also it was so like the music every record would work on a dance floor everything was just perfect in that record label and then I look at Dirty Bird now and it's very formulaic it's very um, not what it was. And and I think for me, that's the issue with certain record labels when they're artist driven is that they just get very samey. And it's not about kind of evolving as an artist or evolving as a, as a label. It's, it's more so about, okay, this is a business and let's just keep it as a business and do what it is. But I think eventually it kind of falls out of its ass. How have you found it? Well... What I would say to that is the, the music industry generally rewards doing the same thing repeatedly. Mm. Uh, that's what generates money over time. That's what generates a enduring brand. And that's true for, for acts. Uh, and it's true for, I think, labels which have that kind of association. So, I mean, like, I mean, even like the biggest acts are like that and, um if you look at i mean i've used this example before like if you look at like you know two of the biggest bands in the world like metallica and u2 have had um really successful early periods and then a bit in the middle where they sort of took a bit of a left turn yeah and 
then we're like fuck no we better start doing that stuff that people liked us for again <laughs> and <laughs> and successfully perform the u-turn right and and continue to their you know trajectory towards our untold wealth and uh fame so um the the dance scene is despite the fact that it's not primarily artist driven i would argue it's tr it's primarily driven by the genre the, the genres that people follow i think um, and maybe that's changed a little bit in recent years but i think generally speaking people say i like techno yeah. rather than i like adam bayer like mm. that, it'll be like it'll be the techno thing first and then i like adam bayer yeah um <clears throat> so uh there's maybe a little bit of a less uh you might expect there to be less of a tendency to do that, but actually it's not true, I don't think. And, you know, like you're saying, like Dirty Bird's a good example. I mean, Drum Code's another example where there's a really distinct distinct sound that people know, and it changes a little bit over time, but really what they're doing is giving the punters what they want. Yeah. And like I said, that is absolutely the right thing to do. Mm. Like if, if anyone's listening to this, I'm wondering how, like at the start of their, or aspiring to have a career in this, in this, uh, in this industry don't do what i did I, I would absolutely advise you against it do what adam bayer did 100 percent. but um you know i think that i mean and don't get me wrong I, I i i'm not sitting here wishing i had done that yeah because it's not me it's not who i am totally and you know having said what i just said you can't be anyone other than who you are so um i mean those are two contradictory pieces of advice but i mean you know, in my own instance, like I, I just get, um, I, well, I was asked this question the other day actually, and the, they put it in, in, they put it in the following terms, like, do you get bored easily? And that was uh, something that I used to say in interviews quite a lot to, to explain my uh, haphazard approach to musical styles and, and what we cover on the label. But I, and I don't think that's quite right. I think it's more to do with um, like expressing something musically both myself in the studio and then and releasing stuff it, it tends to be like whatever i'm playing in my dj set which is you know uh a re reflection of what i'm making and what i do generally <clears throat> so they will have a few years a couple of years or two or three years where i'm um into whatever style and that's what we'll put out that's what i'll make and sometimes there's really abrupt stylistic changes you know <laughs> sometimes it's they've been like more kind of smooth shifts but like you know around 2011 12 we just stopped doing quite unquote deep dubstep and started doing house i mean yeah. it's just insanity <laughs> really when you think about it it's commercial suicide um and and particularly because like what was happening at that particular time like dubstep was the hugest thing yeah. in the fucking world right so terrible idea but i mean i don't know I, mean, I just like like i said it's just who i am and i can't change it but and and i think like really it's like it the fact that i'm still here doing it and the fact that hot flush is still here is just down to persistence mm. it's just down to having you know a level of success which is sufficient without ever being like you know huge but sufficient to keep it going and then just you know plowing on you know and being i hate the word authentic but you know just being who you are you know being just me being who i am mm. and expressing that through the music that I make and the music that I release and enough people <laughs> come along on the ride for it still to be a going concern, really, you know, I mean, it's difficult not to be slightly, I, I don't know. I mean, I know I sound very cynical when I talk about this stuff and I don't, you know, I'm, it's slightly affected, but you know, it's, um, it's uh, well, <laughs> the experience of um, people's reactions to it has, uh, made me like this basically <laughs> but, but but it's completely understandable don't get me wrong i do understand why you know when you like something and i've I have experiences this as well like you know the bands or whatever who i love and then they make an album that you don't like which is a bit totally. like a, of a different approach yeah. like, fuck like this isn't yeah. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not here for this yeah right? so i totally understand it but yeah it, it is i guess the, the thing is is that like what you're saying is you go from releasing dubstep to house music or to techno that is a huge turnaround that's like chalk it's and completely cheese different aesthetic right it's that's the thing and and it was largely it was largely sort of fired by my desire to not play 
at those parties anymore because okay. that, that's the difference right why that, though what what were they what was going on at those parties that, that was like i do not want to be part of this rewinds <laughs> doing rewinds you know it's just this kind of arms race for the rewind yeah just, fuck man like i just want to play for four hours and not be bothered by you know not have that kind of pressure every three minutes to deliver some enormous drop and um that was just where i was with it you know and i just wanted to was that always was... there though sorry to butt in but was that always there or was that when the more americanized dubstep kind of started to take over and because i i i'll be honest dubs I, Dubstep was never for me. I grew up in Bristol, so dubstep was always around me, but I was the person that would always refuse to listen to it at the time because everyone else was listening to it. So it was never like on my radar. I never really went to many dubstep kind of parties. Hmm. Well, I mean, the early dubstep scene was genuinely a thing of beauty. Yeah. It was just an amazing sort of little community of people, and it sort of um it led to it kind of sprouted up similar little things in various places around the world in a way which is kind of quite unique actually but unfortunately uh we all know what happened with the music right <laughs> and it's uh it wasn't you know i <laughs> i have sometimes you know blamed the north americans in a slightly tongue-in-cheek kind of a way but it's a little bit unfair because you know the kind of the rewind mentality um it just comes with big parties, right? Mm. So as soon as you have a big room full of people and they're most I mean, they're mostly interested in when the next bass drop is going to happen, that that will just, you know, that that kind of mentality will just develop, I think, yeah, naturally. So so it wasn't just Skrillex, you know, it wasn't just <laughs> those guys. Although they did kind of turn up the volume quite significantly on that kind of stuff. But you know, I was well out of it by then. I think certainly mentally checked out of it. But I mean, like I said, like the initial, I mean, you know, I was, at the, you know, went to the very first forward in 2001, you know, we did our first release in 2003 and, you know, the Marianne Hobbs show wasn't until 2006. So there was a pretty long mm. period of standing in a room once a month because forward was once a month, back, once a month back then with 30 guys and two girls and swapping cds and it just being the best thing ever you know it yeah. sounds so shit but it was genuinely the best thing ever and you can't recreate that you know like either you're there or you're not and it's difficult to keep it going as well and as soon as it is exposed to loads more people it's something is immediately lost and and you know the watching the process of it become popular was genuinely amazing like the dmz first birthday uh was just a mind-blowing night i'll never forget it it was just insane and you know, it was the culmination of like yeah like i said five years of standing in a room expecting nothing ever to happen but you know it was always a question of like well what happens next now and and you know <laughs> it was probably quite predictable in in reality yeah but you know me moving to berlin was a kind of an anticipation of that i suppose i mean i was i was very much kind of checked out the whole thing wanted to do something different um and it you know i moved to moved over in 2007 and we didn't do our <laughs> pivot to house until 2011 2012 so yeah there was a few years of um trying to plow a furrow in that would make it uh keep the kind of original vibe for want of a better term and make it cool but and and the, you know that that period was cool actually as there was some really interesting music made that wasn't that kind of rewind chasing bullshit uh but you know everything has its shelf life i guess you know and Agreed. i think like you know the, the the house thing which happened the uk house thing that happened in kind of 2011 12 13 it was just fun yeah you know and i think that was the difference i think the people that were involved in post dubstep that kind of stuff were just ready to have some fun and make some money quite frankly yeah you know? <laughs> like, and that was it i guess when you, as an artist, when you decide to go from dubstep to house or techno, how does that affect you financially? Well, I was living in Berlin and paying 300 euros a month rent. So there was not a massive financial <laughs> yeah. pressure to do much. But having said that, um, we 
had had some pretty successful releases on the label and we had a good catalog and it was ticking over um like dubstep is um, bass music generally drum and bass included is not well paid comparatively speaking dj wise so um my I, I would I, this wasn't it wasn't a, definitely wasn't a primary motivation i mean I, I kind of said that in a kind of glib kind of a way but it, it it wasn't anything like the forefront of my mind i mean i'd been able to make a good living at that point for a few years uh from from djing and from selling music and i was sort of aware that you know house djs got paid more but not i mean it wasn't like fuck i need some of that house paper yeah <laughs> um it was a you know I, I, let's try and do this it will be fun i don't have a mortgage or anything like you know i don't have any i don't have a family you know it was like you know i was i guess 28 or something and it was you know just a, a shot in the dark really without thinking too much about it i mean that's my whole career has really been a succession of shots in the dark <laughs> but i mean it, it definitely wasn't something that i was thinking too hard about um but then you realize fuck you know there's, there is real money to be made yeah. here which is great I and mean, you know that's fine that's absolutely fine i mean people are sniffy about money and music but you know if you have the opportunity if you have the opportunity to get paid proper money to play music which you can genuinely stand behind i think that's that's the problem is where people do stuff which is when it's just for the money you know fuck that but if you can if your artistic vision coincides with getting paid a lot of money then great fucking go, cool. go get the bank absolutely yeah it's it's a weird concept it's weird that people are weird about money in the music industry <laughs> i mean certain parts of it yeah certain parts of it are more than happy for extreme financial success but certainly in, in dance music it's it's a little bit well i think that's what I, you know go back to what i said about how dance music is is a very much of a backwards looking consulty conservative kind of a scene like there is still sort of the concept of of selling out it's still in people's totally. minds to extent i mean it, it's definitely not what it once was and it, it um, manifests in different ways, but I think that slight sniff, not sniffiness, I don't know what the right word is, um, that kind of, the sort of reluctance to embrace that as an aesthetic, like wealth, I mean, in the way it is in hip hop, for example, yeah. you know, that's just not there at all. And I think it's, it's basically because people have that kind of, um, that, they're looking back to that 90s period even if it's subconsciously um and it just doesn't fit in with that aesthetic at all mm. you know i mean even the um even the private jet stuff you know <laughs> don't even get me is, started on that yeah I, I i totally agree um but even that stuff is a little bit it's it's muted it's you know what i mean it's like i mean obviously there are certain except, exceptions to that but like it's not um it's not what it yeah it's not as bad as it could be i think it's so like i said when you compare it to hip-hop it's it's nothing right yeah I mean, no, no one's like throwing blocks of hundred dollar bills around or anything like that oh yeah give it time give it time <laughs> the thing that i the thing with the whole private jet thing is i'm i'm all for people taking private jets because i understand that like people have like there's certain things if you're doing three shows in one night like you have to take a private jet there's like no other way to get there I guess the thing that I just don't like is the whole um, bragging about it on social media. The whole, it, but even for me, like the whole bragging about anything is weird to me on social media. Like even the amount of people, I'm sure you see it on every time you open up Instagram, it's like, thank you to my sellout show last night. Thank you to this. Thank <laughs> you to that. And it just like, it, that cringes me out like personally I mean, the amount the amount of uh djs who genuinely can sell out a show which is to say like that it's like their show it's just them rather than a rave being sold out mm. like the amount of djs who can really deliver that is tiny yeah is the truth and most of the time when you see a dj say oh yeah i sold out this it's it's a rave being sold out and it's largely due to the brand that's doing it uh sitting on on the top of that flyer right so i mean yeah but people talk a lot of shit and that stuff for some 
reason just resonates though on on socials and um it's really lame but it does and you know it would be nice if you know <laughs> ravers weren't as susceptible to it as everyone else but but they just clearly are you know like everyone it's the kind of thing that everyone moans a bit and moans about and no one would admit to themselves uh <laughs> you know affects them in that way but it clearly does you know totally and well it's it's, just, it's also about creating and passing a message on right and i think if you're telling everybody you've sold out a show it creates a hype and it creates a something where oh i have to get a ticket first next time because i missed out or, yeah it's, it's, it's fomo right it's, yeah of course it's and, and creating the uh illusion illusion, or not sorry, illusion. It's, it's creating the impression of of scarcity and, and something that people want to be uh uh getting involved in you know that's it's marketing right it's marketing 101 that kind of shit and and fine you know we're all trying to make a living here you yeah. know and so on on that level i i can i can understand it and i can um i can accept it it's just you know it's just you just sort of like i roll it unfortunately <laughs> and you know i think mean, i think with socials though generally like you can do it in a way which isn't like you can say the same things and you can send the same messages without resorting to that kind of bullshit exactly basically yeah it's just i think it's lazy essentially to do that and the, the people who are best at social media are find a way of sending those marketing messages in a way which is much more personal mm. and says more about them in particular as an as an artist you know as a as a as a musician hopefully or but just something it's an entity which people want to go and see and interact with basically i think that's what performing artist basically is these days so yeah it's possible to do it but unfortunately like the lowest common 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 denominator stuff it does work yeah yeah, yeah um, totally mm. what's your relationship with social media because over the years obviously you've gone from not having social media to social media and and most yeah. of the industry being based on social media yeah well i was a enthusiastic enthusiastic twitter user as some of the audience will be aware um and it are you a shit talker it, on twitter uh, if, you, <laughs> if if anyone listening to this or watching this wants a good laugh google scuba calvin harris twitter beef oh no what happened yeah i'm, I'm not <laughs> put it this way i was the worst hangover i've ever had in my life um <laughs> But it was quite funny. I, I basically, with in the early, like Twitter in its early years was obviously a very different place to how it is now. Yeah. Right. And there was much more freedom allowed and much more um, leeway given, I think, to the way people would communicate on that. And my approach to it was basically to kind of assume this kind of pantomime villain persona, um, which, <laughs> you know, um, was a lot of fun at the time but then there was this kind of shift and i think it was like 2013 ish maybe and suddenly you know the, the benefit of that was no longer given on there you know and i think generally speaking on on socials like i think that was around the time that you know the the kind of lines were drawn and you had to pick a side yeah you know and i'm absolutely on the you know i'm a broadly kind of left-leaning person and i'm absolutely not going to be on the side of the you know the, those other people absolutely not <laughs> but the problem is if you made a if you constructed a kind of media personality for yourself where you basically take the contrary view to everyone else like when i mean dance music is a very much of a kind of monoculture in that respect mm -hmm. certainly with regards to kind of social liberalism and that kind of stuff when i'm absolutely <laughs> a socially liberal person but if someone's, if, I mean, it's it's so a lot of that stuff is so humorless. It's so easy to take the piss out of. Um, so the, the the kind of instinct is to do it right, but you you just cannot, you know, <laughs> absolutely not be value your career. Do not take the piss out of any socially liberal causes. Um, but but you know, that was that's always my instinct is to is to take the piss out of that that kind of stuff and you know take take the contrary line I suppose. Um, and you just can't do it anymore. You know? No, you're and so it's, you're one hundred percent right. I literally say to all my friends, I'm 
all of our careers, we're one tweet away from being cancelled and our careers to be over. And it's yeah. it's literally like that. And it's like you're you're not necessarily even really allowed your own opinion if you are public fronting in the way. Absolutely not. I mean, there are certain there are certain areas which I won't name, but there are certain areas which just just don't go anywhere near yeah. them. Like anywhere near them. Gender. It's just not worth it. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't. I'm not. I'm not, I'm, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna specify in any way. Like it's just not worth it, and it's and, and like that is frustrating, mm. right? Mm. It's annoying that that is the case, but you know you just have to accept it. You know, and it's very easy to get pissed off about it, and like, and particularly I think like because of that period of Twitter where you genuinely could have like discussions with people i mean i, I remember like i mean I, i'm slightly exaggerating the extent to which i was provocative on that i would i was um you know i would i would i would provoke people and i would kind of like take the odd controversial line for the sake of it but a lot of the time it was just like genuinely discussing stuff with people yeah um and i'd spend hours on there just fucking going, having a back and forth with people and you know just in quite an enjoyable way you know in quite an engaging way and i you know um people who are fans of my music would like get into that side of it too you know so talking about music but also talking about politics and talking about you know, various different things um which interests me and and that was i really kind of i, th I felt like it added something mm. you know to what i was saying as an artist like i really genuinely did um but but a big part of it was like assuming this sort of slightly sort of caricatured version of myself right it wasn't like it's never a you know i think that well the nature of twitter generally people people aren't themselves on twitter i think it's yeah. just yeah like that, that happens to everyone you end up being this sort of slightly uh either censored or certainly curated version of what your your, your real personality is but like certainly in, in that period i was like yeah it was it reinforced what i was saying musically you know and it made sense mm. so to that extent it's frustrating to not be able to weigh in on certain issues, especially issues that you know get people so pissed off in something someone's got a comical way, but you know, you just have to accept that this is how it's gone now, you know. And yeah, it's very strange. It's it's very strange, and it's also it's conversations that I'm having with friends and artists, and not even just in the music industry, just generally in life. But it's like you have the you have the conversations around the dinner table, but you. You bet you can't even have it online. You can't even say stuff. And it is very debilitating to a certain extent. However, I find that things go hard one way and then go hard the other way and then somehow comes into the middle and it kind of works itself out eventually over time. And I just hope it does do that. Yeah, I mean, I think the problem with Twitter in particular is that it's become like in fact i was i was reading about this yesterday like uh i think the demise of tumblr was significant there mm. like so a lot of the like more sort of radical uh socially liberal discourse would would play out on tumblr and when that platform you know declined to the extent that it did uh it moved over to twitter basically which just rose like raised the temperature of the way that kind of stuff gets discussed on Twitter. And also it's disproportionately significant in political debate. You know, I think it's um, politicians and media in, in, uh, in that side of things really put far too much emphasis on the way uh, issues are discussed on that platform in particular. Right. And when you've got that, it just becomes a, it's just misleading yeah. basically like the, the way uh the, the the attitudes people have and the way things are expressed is misleading and doesn't reflect even other social media platforms yeah right so comparing it to i mean uh just i mean just looking at the way people talk to each other on instagram is so much nicer totally you know? yeah it's just just quite you know it's a little bit toxic unfortunately <clears throat> and, and i don't think having someone like elon musk in charge of it is necessarily going to quieten things down much <laughs> but you know i don't know what do you think about tiktok what do you think about tiktok getting banned there's a question 
I don't, I'll be honest, I pay zero attention to any media, any politics, anything. I, during, during COVID, I just stopped everything and I just like kind of curated my own little world, which is probably not the healthiest thing. Um, Mm. but like I, I consume what I want to consume. Um, I have friends that I can discuss things with. So when it comes to like TikTok, Twitter, I literally just consume what I want to consume. I I think with TikTok, I've got friends that have, I had I had a guy on the podcast. Um, I recorded an episode with a guy on the podcast yesterday, and TikTok has completely changed his life to the point where he's he's a chef and he started doing content on TikTok and he's now got 1.5 million followers and is making an absolute fortune from from TikToking and it's allowed him to kind of create other businesses outside of the the platform um and put food on his table for his kids and his wife and I think that's fucking amazing um my view on how TikTok is <coughs> is changing the attention span of the world i don't think tiktok is the only reason but i think tiktok is one of the main reasons why people just aren't as interested with with long form um media um i think it's fucked (laughs) and i think the whole data thing that like yeah whatever like we give all of our data to everybody anyway on a daily basis and, and yeah, but I mean, not to a communist dictatorship. In fairness, <laughs> I totally agree. <laughs> but I, 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 I guess realistically, like, how how do we know where our data is going in the first place? Like, is face is 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 Mark Zuckerberg as bad as? No, he, of course he's not as bad as a communist dictatorship, but like we're also in the western world it's like what are we in the conversation (laughs) (laughs) like what are we i I just i just don't really look into it too much if i'm honest and i'm probably the the wrong person to kind of comment on it because they just i'm just like use it for what you want like china can have all my data i don't really give a fuck like it's not really going to affect me in the grand scheme of things yes maybe in the future and maybe i should be a little less naive about it and look at it as a bigger scale but i don't know what's your thoughts <laughs> well i mean i guess the like that that is probably a common view right i think that attitude towards it is probably analogous to you're the average user yeah or tiktok and of socials generally and i guess the, the issue is like you know it's actually the the totality of the users in aggregate which is what makes it uh important right so i mean just just st- sticking on tiktok um like I think, you know the reason that they they might ban it is because half of americans use it like it's definitely <laughs> controlled to at least a certain extent by what is a hostile <laughs> yeah and the ability of them to put their thumb on the scale as it were of you know uh, content which is reaching that number of citizens of of a of a given country that's a huge amount of power you've got over totally. that population right? totally agree so it's just a tool of propaganda potentially yeah you know and obviously no one can tell um to what extent if at all that is being used but just the potential for it to be used you can understand why they're maybe not too keen on that happening but i mean with the there's kind of wider stuff which is applicable to i mean just taking that the ownership um debate the the ownership angle just taking that off the table like if it it got spun off from bite dance if they don't that's one potential solution to it is that it's not banned but they spin it off to you know and and then have it publicly traded on the on the nasdaq or whatever um like the the problems with it with regards to what you know what you were saying uh attention span but also you know 
the mental health implications for kids yeah which are pretty well established at this point like it's not like a controversial thing to say that uh you know teenage girls really don't benefit from using these sorts of applications um like that seems to me that like legislation is going to have to catch up with that Mm -hmm. as well you know and that's been a feature of the way that big tech has developed over the last well since basically since facebook right like the um politicians in pretty much everywhere actually just haven't kept pace with the development and the increasing ubiquity of these platforms and the effects that they have on the population right it's just um seeming i i think it's just only explainable by looking at who the politicians are yeah which is to say they're disproportionately old particularly in the u.s like they're used to a pace of change and a um a process of writing legislation which is really slow and the just the the nature of tech is that you know if you you're writing something like writing an act writing a an act of parliament or whatever which is going to come into court it's going to come into force in like two years time or whatever but the whole for sure things changed in two years yeah. right so yeah i think that like the development of, of social media more generally is like it's, it's not been a good advert for representative democracy I, at all yeah know? i i don't disagree i guess my view on that side of things is it's not necessarily about legis- legislating tech because we know the internet what no matter how old you are as a kid especially the younger the kids get the more um they're way more tech savvy than the than the, the people that are older if you know what i mean it's a classic example that you you give your kids your phone and they'll teach you how to use it um sure. i think like with um I, I, what i really mean i think is like the legislation of stuff like data like what you're talking totally about. yeah i guess for me though on the mental health side of things is it's more so about the legislation of education and it's how do you educate the younger generation how how can we as i'm not a parent but how can we as parents as older people as schools as co- the curriculum educate people on mental health in modern day society because it's very different to when we grew up if you know what i mean like when we grew up it was like people would have issues with the magazines because they'd be like size zero models and like it was a huge thing then but it was just on a different scale because it wasn't as readily available now it's readily available everywhere and yet mental health is still not even spoke about in fucking schools so yeah so what what i say to that is like like there's always hysteria around what children consume Mm -hmm. so whether it's like metal lyrics or rap lyrics or video games or like you say magazines like there's always a hysteria i think the difference with this is that it's so well established that it is harmful yeah like you know the um the (laughs) the um connection to the supposed connection of violent video games to like school shootings yeah like that was just that was an evidence free back of the envelope piece of like you know boomer hysteria right <laughs> essentially and likewise uh you know the lyrics and you know it, this is this is this is not serious right but it's like i said pretty well established that using stuff like instagram uh when your brain is developing is really bad yeah. you know and it seems to be like it's going to be well i mean there's, there's a number of ways this could play out but it could quite easily just be seen as being analogous to like alcohol mm, or something totally you know you just can't do it until you're 18 because it's just really bad for you yeah you know? obviously, obviously, obviously people will but just the kind of general attitude in society towards it um that's a potential scenario i mean another scenario is that it just doesn't get regulated at all and like we have a generation upon generation of really fucked up people which is completely possible i also think i i kind of like to put my faith in people a little bit and i see it with like my niece and nephews and 
the the oldest is like 11 now um and yeah he consumes a lot of youtube a lot of youtube but his views on instagram and things like that he's like why would i want to put my life on the internet which for me is like really interesting it's puberty right <laughs> yeah exactly but again like i was just in south america and there was a lot of like i noticed a lot of people like on social media there that would very rarely post they would consume but they'd very rarely post and there was a lot of like you'd go on somebody's profile and there'd be like three photos and you're like oh this is really interesting that like this there's a whole population of like younger kids that are going out raving and that are, cu- that are consuming our our content but they're actually not putting the content out themselves or not trying to be a famous social media influencer which is really interesting because I, th- I think we grew up we're or we're in the age of like that boomer kind of stage where we're not boomers but like where we we kind of discovered it and trying to work it out and we've worked it out now and now it's like does the generations after us go you know what i don't actually want that yeah i mean i think like um the way people use tiktok is very much like that right the vast majority of tiktok users just scroll through videos mm-hmm. they're not making videos themselves right and there isn't really a function um or the primary function of tiktok isn't to like get people to post it to get people to watch videos yeah um, and yes, I think you're completely right to say, I mean, like the, uh, the, the first generation of social media, media units, which is to say us, like that was that I mean, the, the kind of attraction of it was that kind of, like, oh, I'm going to post yeah. up a picture. I'm going to post what I think. And like, you know, that was just obvious. And it was kind of built in, I think, to those, the early versions of those platforms. And I think some of it is actually the reaction to the platforms themselves and how they're designed, mm-hmm. right. What they encourage users to do um i think with the te- with the kind of teenage thing i mean i th- i mean without without i mean i haven't read the actual research and i don't know the you know the exact you know detail of the, of the studies i think teenage girls are i think my understanding of it is that they are more likely to post images themselves and then rank themselves socially Agreed. based on the reaction to those videos right and it's yeah. what the, what that kind of stuff triggers in like psychologically triggers so i think that particular group is seen to be particularly susceptible and more so than boys mm. like teenage girls in particular um so you'd think that that would be a fairly obvious piece of regulation to introduce right but uh, but i mean like you say the more general um direction of travel with these platforms is uh much more of a consumption one right yeah. so i mean yeah you mentioned youtube and youtube's just just you know <laughs> it's underestimated how huge of a thing that it is yeah. right and particularly with with young people right um I and mean, it is an amazing resource i think youtube is incredible like you can do like you can learn how to do literally anything on yeah, youtube yeah it's fucking amazing like, yeah, I mean, I can do DIY now, thanks to YouTube. <laughs> Literally, like <laughs> my nephew, my nephew came over a few months ago, and this was he was like the five year old, and he called the bin. He was like, "Can you put this in the trash?" I was like, "Where the fuck <laughs> have you learned that from?" Like, you are English. It's called the bin. This is not the trash. He's like, "Oh, YouTube." I'm like, "Fuck's sake, those Americans are taking over." It's rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> not garbage yeah exactly yeah it's it's, there's massive pros and cons to everything and i think it's a really healthy discussion to have and i think people should be discussing it more um but there are there's some huge pros and cons to to social media and i think it's that balancing game of where do you sit involved and and also it's like I guess the question for you is like, how does it affect you in your, in your mental health with social media? Is it something where it actually has ever affected you as a, as a, as an artist, as a person, or is it, or is it not? Oh yeah. I mean, I've had the, (laughs) the sort of Damocles of cancellation above my head more than once. Mm. Never fully fallen, but, uh, it's, it's, um, 
It's something that I've <laughs> uncomfortably close shaves with. And um, wow, that was quite a good sword analogy. Show um, <laughs> the uh, when it's bad, it's really bad, right? And even when it's not like you're actually going to get cancelled, when just having a bad exchange with someone mm. on social media, it's just, ugh, it's horrible. You know, it's really horrible. And you know, I've had definitely periods where I've had to just take, take, you know, delete all the apps and like, you know, have to step away from it. But I think Twitter is particularly bad, certainly for me. And uh, I, you know, described the way that I used it in the kind of early days of it, the early years, and how. how that, that, but it was just really quite positive for most of that time and then for it to become a really negative thing um and a real sort of drag on what i was doing instead of a you know a headwind instead of a you know a tailwind and just sort of realizing that and then you know there's a kind of compulsive addictive feature to all of these platforms and when you're really used to it it's, it's, it is quite difficult to you know to step away and to kind of readjust the way you're using it because I mean, they're they're important marketing tools. That's the thing. Yeah. Like it's like I think um, you know there are a very small number of acts of artists who make a point of not having any socials at all, and that's great. But you know the vast majority, almost everyone, like it's unavoidable. You have to have a like at least a strategy mm. for it, right? Even if if you're not doing it yourself, like it's just you know it's the primary form of communication in the world now you know yeah. it's just on you know it's just, just no two ways about it so yeah you have to accept that and, and and try and find a way of doing it i mean like i said like you have to find a way of doing it which is which makes sense for you you know and which which accurately or hopefully if that's your <laughs> your, your um uh if that's your intention accurately represents who you are as a, as a person or whatever you're trying to say artistically. And you know, I think that's the challenge for musicians is to kind of use those tools in a way, which really you know, adds value for want of a better term yeah. to what you're doing, but it's not always easy. You know, I mean, I think like you know, all of these things can be used in a really creative kind of a way, mm, you know, it doesn't good. have to be negative like it, and it doesn't have to be um, a chore. It doesn't have to be, you know something which is you know you've got to do oh god i've got to do my social space like you can use these things in in a way which are fun yeah you know? um, but it's funny way to do that yeah i totally agree i totally agree ma'am um 20 years of hot flash obviously um another 20 years i'll be old in 20 years time <laughs> i'm really really old i'm quite old now but in 20 years, so I will be I will genuinely be old. I don't know, man. Like, uh, it's basically as long as it's fun. I was going right? to say, have you enjoyed it? Because I think this is like, I know you're quite cynical. I'm from, I've never met you in person. I've only met you in an hour and 40 minutes. But I'm getting the very cynical vibes. But for doing something for 20 years, you must have enjoyed it. Oh, 100%. It's the, like, like I said, it's my life's work, really. Yeah. Like, looking at any any sort of objective way this is my life's work. And like I said, as long as it's, as long as it's fun and not, um, and doesn't feel like I'm just going through the motions or just doing it for the money or all of that stuff. Um, then why not? Yeah. Like what else am I going to do <laughs> at this point? Quite frankly, yeah. you know, I mean, I love making music and I love DJing, but a big part of what I do is is releasing other people's music. And I really enjoy that. I love finding new artists. I love giving people a platform. I love helping to build people's careers. I really find that rewarding. Yeah. And I think like, the older I get, the more I appreciate that, actually. I think mm. that that's that's the thing. Like I'm talking about like another 20 years. Like that's that's the I mean, I haven't got kids either, but like that's the kind of that's the kind of side of it which I really which resonates with me more now than it than it used to. You know, finding young people who have got something to say artistically, have got, mm. you know, musical talent that needs a bit of nurturing, needs a bit of help. That's what I really enjoy doing, you know? And having a label enables you to do that, yeah. you know? It's uh, really special. So, I, th yeah. I think it's something really uh, special that it's about, it's, for me, it's almost giving back to the community. And Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's really important and and being able to bring people through and also allowing artists to leave the label 
and go and do their own thing, which is really important to me. I feel like there's a lot of labels that don't actually allow that and don't like that and kind of uh, have like a chokehold on their artist because that's it's just a weird ego thing. But I think something with that I've seen with Hot Flush over the years is that it's it's blossomed artists into their own careers and then allowed them to do their own thing, which I think is super important. Yeah, man. I mean, we've had people go to Warp, go to Domino, go to Majors. And, you know, if, like if someone is achieving that level of success via our label, then that's great. You know, then mm. I've done my job right, you know, at, at the end of the day. Like, I mean, if people want to stick around and do stuff with Dustin, then that's, that's fantastic. But if people are getting those kind of offers, then, you know, that reflects well upon us. Yeah. You know, it's the way I see it. So, yeah. And like I said, like the process of finding new people is to me the fun bit, you know? How do you so, do that? Um, how, how do you, how do you do that? Cause like for me as a label, like I started my record label more as a outlet for me to release music. Cause I was in a strange position with the music I was writing really didn't fit anywhere that, I felt it would be kind of welcomed as a home. So I was like, okay, let's just start my own thing. And then I can kind of bring artists up and kind of help help grow them. But it was mostly a way for me to put music out myself. And I really struggle with the A&R process of finding music that I actually like to sign. Mm. I mean... <laughs> It, it really varies if you're asking yeah how, how does it work i mean <laughs> i get like like every dance label right we get sent just avalanches of just <laughs> unnational rubbish yeah right? just like you know the, the worst kind of uh youtube production tutorial powered tech house yeah um, <laughs> which is pretty dispiriting to have to wade through but wade through it you must because occasionally and it's not very often you find something which is which is really great and like i mean it it, it does vary i mean i have signed he i have found people who have just emailed the label mm. like george fitzgerald just emailed the label yeah. that's how george fitzgerald got got, got his break in music was just randomly emailing hot flush recordings um i mean there's been other ones where i've met people socially and you know we've got on and then they say, I make music. And you're like, oh God, oh no. <laughs> I'm going to have to listen to it. But sometimes it's amazing. Yeah. And that's the best time. You know, that's the best, that's the best one. The word, <laughs> um, like I said, that's not always a, a sentence you want to hear when you've met someone socially. <laughs> but I mean, the, uh, yeah, I mean, it, music is, well, I mean, the beauty of, yeah, I, I mentioned developments in music tech, right? And how it's, uh lowered the barriers to entry so so many people make music now mm. and it's which means the opportunity to find people is is everywhere um now that you know makes it harder in some respects but it you know it means that there are there is more to be had yeah so yeah i mean there's no i mean look i mean <laughs> i'd be lying if i said i'd listen to everything we get sent but I think making the effort to do it. I mean, for example, you know, Seymour Stein, the uh, legendary music executive and A&R guy passed away, I think yesterday. Mm. And one of the many tributes that I noticed to him on social media was that it was an observation that he just listened to so much unsigned music, yeah. you know, into his 50s, 60s and even 70s, you know, just across all new acts, you know, just listening, 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 listening. And at the end of the day, um, if you love music, like that process of discovery is unbelievably rewarding, you know, even if you've got a way to, like the, <laughs> the 150 tracks of <laughs> cookie cutter tech house, they you forget all of them in, in an instant when you find that one, which is like, fuck, yeah, this is great. Totally. And your previous two hours of whoa. <laughs> disappears is that how you do it though is that how you kind of go through that process of like okay i a lot a certain amount of time to go and listen through promos um i i'm quite haphazard with it to be mm. honest uh I, I mean i do that kind of thing a fair bit but 
um i don't have like a you know if i was more organized then that that would be a good way of doing it yeah like if I've got kind of like 11 till 12 a.m wade through terrible music <laughs> in the hope of finding it's music. fucking depressing <laughs> mate it can be so depressing oh I mean, it absolutely can be yeah no, you're 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 totally right but like i said once once you find that one then you you don't remember it. It's like giving birth, right? No no woman remembers giving birth. He just like you know you've got the kid at the end of it. That's it, right? I that, think that, coming from a man, you can't say that ever again. <laughs> probably not. Anecdotally, that's my understanding of how it works, right? Yeah, women feel... tend not to dwell on the uh, the, the process. It's more the uh, what you have at the end of it, which is the important bit. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that, man. Dude, um, we're nearly coming up to two hours, so let's wrap this motherfucker up. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, really enjoyed this chat. Um, how can people get involved with your podcast? How can people listen? Um, and how can people get involved with the label? And also, oh, hang on. Are you coming to America as well? Did uh, I, did I, I see something on your Wait, socials? When's, when's, this, when's this going out? This is when's coming this out in May, second or third week in May. Are you, are you, would okay, you well, have... I will have been to America. So thanks to everyone who came to my show. <laughs> festival shows in north america next week um yeah hotflushrecordings.com is the label scubaofficial.io is scuba stuff the podcast is called not the not a diving podcast and yeah we do it every week and it's good so you should listen to it you also have a patreon right yeah there's a patreon to uh support the show yeah which is um I do sort of bonus podcasts and that sort of thing on there. We have quite, we have a really nice community on Discord actually. Hotflushcorners.com slash Discord is the Discord invite. You don't have to be a Patreon member to get into that. You can just come and say hello. But yeah, we have a really nice little community on there. So yeah, we'd like to see you there. Sick man. If you send me the links, I'll put myself, it. Well, yeah. if, if you send me all the links, I'll put it in the description. So anybody that wants to go check it out, um, go check it out. Mate, thanks for coming on. Keep safe and hopefully catch you soon. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. Cheers, Enjoy mate. Cheers. Peace. See you in a bit. And that is a wrap. Big love to Scooper for coming on. Uh, thanks for listening. Please don't forget to share, subscribe, give us a little review, and I will see you very soon. Keep safe. Till next time.